But nevertheless, we're in it, hanging on those limbs, eating of that fruit, whether we recognize it or not. This is the chart of the plan of salvation. Okay. Let's, now you're familiar with the tree and some of these principles. Let's move now into the Book of Mormon. Let's turn to Mosiah chapter 8, and we're going to see if these Book of Mormon prophets weren't Kabbalic rabbis. I'm going to ask you to start paying close attention to the phrasing. Son? That's the antenna? I thought I'd broken it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to, I just, as soon as I pick up that thing one time, I'm going to whoop. I just, I've broken it already. Okay. Safe. We're safe. Okay, in this Mosiah chapter 8, if you remember the story, uh, Ammon's talking with good king, I think it's uh, good king, because they'd sent a group of people off to find the lost sheep of Zarahemla, and instead they found a town and dry bones, and they, they come back with, plates of brass and a couple of seer stones that were put in there with it. They said, hey, can we read this ancient record? And we're introduced to some concepts here, and I want, you, I want you to pay close attention to some of the verbiage. In verse 17, Ammon says, a seer can know things which are past and also things which are to come. Seers know things which are past and things which are to come. Remember that will be important later. By seers shall all things be revealed, or rather secret things be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light. When Joseph Smith was doing the work on the alphabet and grammar, he said to his scribe and gave him a blessing, and he says, if you continue in this work and you have the proper attitudes, your sins shall be forgiven you, and you shall be allowed to see hidden languages. Where does God hide a language? Where? In the text. In the text. God hides languages within other languages. Seers can see the hidden things. So Joseph's detractors come along and they read these verses and they read it in the Egyptian. And Joseph looks at the same characters and what's he see? The Hebrew popping off the page in front of it. Because they're not armed with the spirit to know how it's even done. Okay? Watch now this something strange going on. Look at the rest of this verse. He says, seers can know, and hidden things shall come to light, and things which are, what? Not. not known shall be made known by them, and also things which shall be made known by them, which otherwise could not be known. Is there anything funny about that syntax? You, you, you always trip over your tongue trying to read it. Why do you suppose Ammon had to put no in there three times? Four times, excuse me. What was the fourth letter of the alphabet? Remember the pains of mortality? By suffering the pains of mortality, we come to? No. We come to knowledge by understanding the opposites. And so, well, if you're going to talk about knowledge, you have to list it how many times? Four times, because it's by this process in the fourth level that we get that. <coughs> Thus God provided the means that man through faith might work mighty miracles. Therefore he, the seer, becometh a great benefit to his fellow beings. Now when Ammon had made an end of speaking these words, the king rejoiced exceedingly and gave thanks to God, saying, Doubtless a great what? Mystery, Mystery is contained where? within the plates. Now I'm going to ask you, where is the mystery? Within. What is on the plates? The characters and the words. The mysteries are contained <coughs> within the structures of the words. That's the way the rabbis would approach it. 
We've not been taught to think that way because we've not been taught the manner of prophesying among the, among the Jews. Okay? We have to begin to think Jewish here. So, these interpreters of the stones were doubtless prepared for unfolding all such mysteries. This mystery, you know, I want you to watch that. That is a flag word. Whenever Kabbalic material is going to be given you in the Book of Mormon, that mystery word's going to come up, and you better start paying attention to the words and how the words are being used. Allah, who said that? <laughs> President Benson. President Benson says, learn the words and how they are used. used. Okay? So, we're going to pay attention to that. The king is so happy to get these records, he waxes poetic and says, how marvelous are the works of the Lord. How long doth he suffer with his people? Yea, how blind and impenetrable are the... What? Understand. Have seen that word before? Of the children of man. For they will not seek what? Wisdom. Neither do they desire that she should what? Rule over them. Does the king know about the tree of life? Does he know that wisdom is she and that understanding is of men? Does this have, does this wisdom and understanding that the king talked about, does that have anything to do with what Ammon was talking about in knowledge? You have a question here. Can you see how those Ammon's conversation and the king's conversation are both tied together by the structure of the tree? And how this apostate version of the structure of the tree that we've got down through the occult world now has to be what? Turn around and reverse so you get she back in its proper side. And the Book of Mormon's helping us do that. Okay, now your question, sis. Well, I noticed here that doubtless is used twice. And if the second letter is Beth, which is the residence, would they not be talking about that this mystery is going to take you back to the first residence? <laughs> oh, Do you understand her, her question? No, no, no. <laughs> More than that, do you understand what the process that we, she went through to get to that question? Can you see that she's already beginning to seek for what? Understanding. Understanding and she's already beginning to think rabbinically and use this structure? I think it's within. It's almost within our own spirits. Once we're introduced to it, that it hath a familiar spirit to it, and so we start to work with these words intuitively. Okay, we start to see. Well, why is that word used twice? Why was doubtless you were? I gave a presentation last night, for instance. A guy came to the presentation. He says, "Can I show you what I did with Second Nephi 30?" He took Second Nephi 30 and just dissected it. Three, seven, twelve. Why is this phrase used three times? And this phrase used three times. And this one used three times. And this one used seven and seven and seven. Once you start to understand this game, when you read the scriptures, what happens? The mystery of the word starts to what? Open up. And you see structure where you never imagined it was there. if you just know how to find it. So my answer is, my gut feeling is, yes, you're probably right. But I, I didn't hear the question yeah. that well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not proper grammar. That's why I'm asking that, because, you know, if, if he were to use proper English, he would have said doubtlessly, rather than doubtless. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. It's just neat. But it's neat. And we're starting to begin to pay attention in these ways. Okay. Now let's go to Alma chapter 5, if you would allow me to. Excuse me, Alma chapter 12, I think it is. And we'll look at some other examples of how this is done. We'll see if Alma was a Kabbalic rabbi. We'll begin in verse 9. Now Alma began to expound these things unto him, saying, It is given to many to what? Know the, the mysteries of God. Now there's your flag. So we're going to start, we got the mystery word there. We're going to start to look at the words. 
Nevertheless, they are laid under strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word. Now, that's an interesting phrase. What does it mean to portion a word? To know Tarek on it. See, now, when I was a missionary, since I had not been trained in the manner of prophesying among the Jews, I thought you were speaking of more or less books of Scripture. I thought those poor Catholics, they're at such a disadvantage because they do not have the Book of Mormon under the Doctrine and Covenants or the Pearl of Great Void. Therefore, they have a lesser portion of the words. Okay? I think I had much to learn. He says, he given a greater, that these people receive a portion of his words which he just granted to the children of men according to the heed and diligence which they given to him. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth what? A lesser portion of the word until, and he that will not harden his heart is given the greater portion of the word until it is given unto him to know the, how much of it does he get to know? He gets to know, know, how many knows are in here? He gets to know the mysteries in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the what? Lesser portion of the word until they know what? Nothing. Okay? Now what I'm suggesting is, is both of them can have the what? The very same words on the page. Both of them can have the same scriptures laying before them, and one will see into the river and see the depths of it on all of these degrees, and the other one will what? He'll see nothing. And the mysteries are hidden. Okay? <coughs> We're getting instruction. These guys were steeped in this philosophy. And we've got to be able to read the Book of Mormon on this level. Have you seen these words before over here? What is the power to overcome the second death? Does that have anything to do with this? Is Alma familiar with the tree? Is he familiar with the word game? Yeah. Does he know he has to use no four times to make it work right? Is he Kabbalic rabbi? So was Abinadi. So was Mosiah. Okay? So was Amulek. So was Nephi. So was Jacob. Let's go now to Jacob chapter 4. I love this chapter because Jacob introduces us to at least four different kinds of technique. Now we're going to start working with the words in different ways now, but hopefully you've, by enough examples, you should be able to follow it. Jacob chapter 4 will begin on verse 8. Behold, great and marvelous are the works of the Lord, how unsearchable are the depths of the there is your flag. Watch for the word play to come. It is impossible that man should find out all his ways, and no man what? No. No, we're going to circle that world, word, right? Of his ways, say they be, it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. For behold, by the power of his word, now the words have what? Power. power. Man came upon the face of the earth, which earth was created by the power of his word. Wherefore, if God being able to speak and the world was, and to speak and man was created, oh then, why not able to command the earth or the workmanship of his hands upon the face of it according to his will and pleasure? According to Jacob, how did the creation take place? By the speaking of words. Do you remember in Joseph Smith's lectures on faith what faith was? Faith is that what? to work by words and not by physical means. That's how Joseph defines it. To work by words and not by physical means. God commanded the creation to take place. Okay. What Jacob is referring to here, I'm going to diverge for just a second. The Father works by faith. The Holy Ghost gives us hope. 
and Christ is the epitome of charity. Faith, hope, and charity. We're talking about faith here now. The faith to create. What we're looking at here is just the first verse of Genesis in Hebrew. This is an interlinear Bible. The words go like this. Bereshit baru Elohim et. The heavens and the earth. This is the question we're going to address right now. In Jacob's understanding of how the creation took place. In the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? According to Jacob. By the word and speaking the word. So Rabbi Akiva and their other boys in the ancient times had this big debate about how the creation took place. They said if the creation took place by God speaking, what had to be created first? The words. So when they read this at this little contraction right here, which is normally thought to be a flag which denotes the direct object of the sentence in which it's being used, okay? It is actually the first Hebrew letter, remember that, A, and the last Hebrew letter in the Hebrew alphabetical order, which is Tau, or Tav, okay, Et, Et, okay, the first and the what? The first and the last. It's the Hebrew way of saying what? Alpha and Omega. So in the beginning was the? And the word was with? God. And the word was? God. So, in the beginning, he created the? Word. Alpha and Omega. And who is Alpha and Omega? Christ. So we're going to say, what's Christ got to do with this ox and this? Can I draw it this way so you can understand it? Scales of justice. And if this is the beginning to begin is this the end are they beginning the end of the alphabet okay so if we're talking about Jesus was Jesus in the beginning with the father was he in the garden with Adam will he come again a second time at the second coming to perform justice upon the earth is there a mystery in this at word <coughs> not anymore because we know how to understand it understand. now we understand the word we're able to go back dissect the word into its component parts look at the symbols and see how they relate to other things we know of and all of a sudden the mystery is and so comes forth the testimony of the word follow that okay let's go back to Jacob chapter 4 now so you understand the context of this verse and where it all came from and why this strange I think I got those lines now in the wrong place, don't I? Gonna have to over do that. So we're introduced first to this uh, this Kabbalic approach of concerning the power of words. Now he says, "Wherefore, brethren, seek not the counsel of the Lord, but take counsel from His hands. For behold, ye yourselves what? No, no. no. that He counseleth in what? Wisdom. And in Justice. and in great mercy. Have you seen those words before?" What is the power over the resurrection? What's this one? And knowledge and what has to come next? What's missing? Understanding. Is, he t is Jacob taking us down the tree? He is, isn't he? Okay, so we go to this next thing. Notice what he says here in verse 13. Behold, my brethren, he that prophesy, let him prophesy to the understanding is men. What is the understanding then? The ability to <laughs> reason, dissect, take apart, analyze the word. Okay? So he's introduced, we're introduced next to this other key word which is truth. He says, wherefore it speaketh of things as they what? Really are, really are and will be and they're manifest to us Plainly. Those are important words. Truth is a knowledge of things as they what? They are. And were as and they sure, were they are. surely will be, according to section 93. Okay? 
That's what truth is. So now I'm going to make you jump. We've talked about this alpha and omega word, this aleph and tau word, right? If I'm going to write in Hebrew the word truth, how do I write it? You're saying, that's why we hired Joel. <laughs> I take the first letter of the alphabet, the end letter of the alphabet, and guess which one we put in the middle? middle what the rabbis call the meridian letter, the middle letter. Emet, truth. A knowledge of things as they what? Were and are and surely will be. Was Christ in the beginning with the Father? Will he come at the meridian of time? Will he return again? Will he return again? Okay, is he then the truth? He says, I am the truth. Okay, can you see the mystery in the word? Okay, so we, we understand these two symbols. Can you see what this is? You're going to have to forgive me as an artist. If I drew this like this, okay, Did you see that might be a bird? Uh, that's not very good. Better defensive end than artist, right? Okay. Now, that's the way I should have drawn it, like that. Okay. Did Christ have anything to do with birds? Quetzalcoatl, he says, is a bird. Isaiah says he shall come with healing in his wings. wings. They lifted up on the cross in the wilderness. Moses lifted up the brazen serpent. serpent. So why do they stick this brazen serpent with wings on the side of ambulances? Whose symbol is it? Okay. So this is in the this is in the meridian. Okay. Yeah, there's chicks. Now, the Jews were stiff-necked people, and they despised words of plainness and killed the prophets and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came? Because they were looking beyond the... Okay, what does the mark mean? They're saying, I don't know that either. I'll supply you the answer. If I don't know how to make my name because I can't write, what do I put on the page? I place my mark. Ezekiel said the angels went through Jerusalem and the city and they put a mark on the forehead of all those. Okay. And the mark was, in Jewish tradition, the Tau. The cross. Those who would be... Pardon? How do you look beyond it? You look beyond the alphabet. See, it's the last letter in the alphabet. If you really wanted to know who Christ was, all you had to do was look at what? The letters. And if you knew how to read the letters and knew the order of the letters, you would have all the testimony you ever needed that Jesus was the Christ. You look beyond the cross. Another, maybe you already see it meaning that. What, what do you see? The Jews look beyond the coming of the Messiah and the meridian of the time for a Messiah yet to come who had already come. They look beyond. We got another rabbi. Mm -hmm. Good good idea. Great idea. Well, that was the mark of the beast. Yeah. The end of the beast. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> what do you call that? Huh? I mean, the opportunity to the reverse of it. Live evil. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Would the mark of the beast be tomorrow? You think that if Christ has a mark, that Satan also has a mark? I suppose so. Okay. Nevertheless, many fell because why? God hath taken away his plainness from him. The, these are the plain and precious things that Nephi was talking about. If you take away the understanding of how this whole system works and the letters, then you take the plainest thing, precious things out of the scriptures. Because you can only read the lesser portion of the word. Because you're missing the depth of it all. Okay? Do you see these words now? 
to finish out the tree, we've got to go through two more stations. What are they? Foundation and what should be left? Kingdom. So where is kingdom? Doesn't appear in that chapter. But what happens? The allegory of Zenos concerning the tame and the wild olive trees is a description of the kingdom in all of its dispensations. And so chapter 4 and chapter 5 are intimately tied together. Chapter 5 is simply an extension of the bottom of the tree for its explanation. You can't have one without the other. The kingdom had to be there. So that great long chapter is what? Simply the foundational piece of the bottom of that tree. But well, these were arbitrarily broken up anyway. Sure. They really didn't have so when they divided the Book of Mormon into chapters, that would be in a nice place. You'd say, that's a good place to put a chapter, right? Mm -hmm. You'd say, put a chapter right there, because he changed his subject, right? Not knowing that he hadn't changed the subject. We don't know nothing. <coughs> okay? Now, somebody mentioned birds. Let's go to 3 Nephi 10. Who knows what was happening in 3 Nephi 10? Do you remember? She says it is the destruction of the Nephites. There was fire and vapors of smoke and death and destruction. What happened? They laid low in the dust. Many cities were sunk into the earth and in the water and the seas. And, and those who were less wicked than the rest were spared. In the midst of that darkness, that thick darkness in which no, there was no light, they hear a voice. Now, has everybody got this truth stuff down? Because now we're going to switch over and we're going to start talking about other key words. We're going to talk about the word voice. Okay. Who is the voice that is speaking? It is Christ. Okay. What does the voice say? And how many times does he say it? Came to pass that there came a voice again unto the people, and all the people did hear and did witness it, saying, O ye people of these great cities which have fallen, who are descendants of Jacob, who are of the house of Israel, how oft would I have gathered you as a yeah. hen, which is what? Bird. The bird, as chickens under her wings, and have nourished you. And again, and again, notice that. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings? He repeats himself. Then he does what? How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. All ye house of Israel whom I have chosen, how oft will I gather you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, if you will repent and return unto me with full purpose of heart. Do you notice a pattern there? Can't they get the idea? Or did, why did Jesus Christ repeat himself four times? Are they coming to knowledge about the pains of mortality? Oh, yeah. Ah. Is there anything about war, pestilence, disease, and death? Has the four destroyers come to visit? Is there anything then about, okay, the tents? Have I, would I, will I? Past, present, and future. future. I am the truth in all dispensations. Okay. And now, whoso readeth, let him understand. And he that hath the scripture, let him search them and see and behold. We better seek for understanding and see and behold 
all the layers of message that are being laid in the construction of this passage. I would also suggest to you that in my heart and mind, the repetition that is going on here are not just words. I believe this is a Hebrew lamentation hymn. In the play in which we are in, sometimes when characters come upon the stage, they just do not say their lines, but they sing them. The angels came and sang at his birth. I think Jesus, the bird, was singing his sad song. If we understood that in its full context. Okay. So let's move to the next slide for you here and read this as if we were looking at it from a Jewish standpoint. Now three nights ago was the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. If I had been a Jewish man living in the dysphoria and could no longer go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice and I wanted to remove the sins of my child, my tradition said that I could do what? I could take on the Day of Atonement a chicken and place it over the head of my son and ritually transfer the sins of the child to the chicken and then kill the and the child would go away free. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under my wing and ye would not. What does it mean to be gathered as a chicken under Christ's wing? It is profound, isn't it? Can you see that the history of that as it's come down to us in our present time? The conquistadors came to the new world. They brought the Catholic religion with them. They gave it to the Indians and the Indians accepted parts of it. Even to this day in Central America, what happens? They all show up at Mass on Easter morning and they listen and they do the rosary and they do the whole thing. They go to Mass, right? In the afternoon after church, they go out and what do they do? Kill the chicken. chickens. And they call it voodoo. What is it? Orthodox Judaism. <laughs> You can't get away from it, okay? I hope to be clearly found under Christ's wing. I hope my sins, every one of them, in spite of my vanity, can somehow be forgiven. Remember that Christ is symbolically a bird. It'll help you where we're going in the rest of this presentation when we start looking at things Egyptian. Going to move now to 3rd Nephi 11, which is the next chapter. Can I ask you a quick question? Go ahead. Do you know, are there any rules of the killing of the chicken, like you shall not break a bone? I don't know. I don't know. I don't practice any voodoo. I just noticed that the... I saw a show on National Geographic about you know, the killing of these chickens, and I thought, why did they do that? And then all of a sudden it all came together and I saw it. It fell in place. It fell in place. It tastes good, doesn't it? Half a familiar spirit. Okay, now, in 3 Nephi 11, which is the next chapter, we see, now, you don't have to believe this is doctrine. I hope you don't believe anything I'm saying tonight except it's confirmed to you by the Holy Ghost. But I'd like to play with you now, mathematically, okay, to give you a flavor for the rabbinical mind. I want you to look here. The next thing, everybody gathers together at the, at the temple in the land bountiful. Again, they hear the voice. The voice is the key word in this passage. Okay? Now, they hear the voice. How many times does the voice speak? Three times. 
How many times is the voice understood? One time. How many times is it listed on the page? Eight times. Three and one and eight equal? Twelve. Is that a holy number? Heavy duty holy number. Right? Now let's do it this way. I'm going to show you the word voice in Hebrew. In Hebrew it's pronounced kol, K-O-L. It's written from right to left this way. I hope you'll see why that's important. Okay. Lamed Vav Kof Kol. Now, what's interesting to me is Kol has a total, if you add those three letters together, Kol adds up to 136. Does that mean anything to you? Say no. It's all right. But if we take 136 and we add 8 to it, what do we got? 144. How does that relate back to the 12? It's the square root, right? Does that have something to do with Christ? Okay. We got 144 here now. If I'm going to divide 144 by 8, what do I come up with? Who's your mathematician? 18. Okay. 18 mean anything to you? Doesn't mean anything to me because I'm not a rabbi. But if I'm a rabbi, I'm doing backflips because 18 is the equivalent of the word hach. Remember the, have you heard the toast, lahaim, to life? Well, this is the life in to life. Okay? 18 is the word life. To live. So, that's just how it's pronounced. No, we're talking, there's two different words here we're dealing with. Coal is over here. That's the word voice. Yes. I don't know. I'm just doing like the rabbis, whatever works. Okay, that's why I said we're just going to play with it so you get a flavor for how the game is played. So Jesus Christ comes and what's he say? I am the light and the light. I am the 18 of the world. What is the what is the eighth letter of the alphabet in Hebrew? See how it's formed? Het. It is the throne, okay, of heaven. After, six, after seven dispensations of time, we can enter back into the kingdom of God. He is coming from the eighth dimension down to the where we are. And he is the voice. Okay. What I'm suggesting to you is that maybe we have not even scratched the surface of our interpretation of the Book of Mormon because we've not been able to look at it in a rabbinical sense. That perhaps somebody went through this chapter and that it was so carefully edited so as to compound the testimony of the mathematics with the testimony of the symbols and the verbiage. That it's coming at us in layers of testimony. Follow that? And so, what you said, Neither Joshua nor Tittle of the law shall pass away, but all shall be fulfilled. All shall be fulfilled. Well, I'm just thinking how many plates are in that game. How many, uh, how they can fit that all into that? Okay. Let's look now at those symbols of the word coal and look and see what voice is. Here's the word voice. You can see the symbols that make up the letters. K or Q, Vav. Lamed, K-O-L. Can you see up above here in the Egyptian where those original symbols came from? Is this too much to, to do? I'm going to have to reverse it.
You wonder why the Pharaoh always carried the shepherd's crook in his right hand? And why his whip or flail in the Hebrew ox goad always had to be in the left hand? Are they opposites? What do they represent? Say it out loud. Justice and mercy. They represent justice and mercy. The voice of him who reigns on the earth. So the Pharaoh saw himself as the voice of God upon the earth. It was God upon the earth. What he said was like God in heaven would say. But thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? So what... So we have these three symbols which go to, then to create that, to create that word. Uh, I don't suppose you can guess what that symbol is. Are those crossed over? Not on this one, no. And the shepherd's crook is in the right hand? Yeah. And the in the left. Why? Why? So I go and I bring the lambs, I reach out with my shepherd's yeah. crook, and I draw the lambs into my oh. fold. I got those wicked black goats, and what do I do with them? I drive them into outer darkness. I bring the one in, and I send the other one away. This fits Isaiah's uh, right and left hand, and giraffe. The light comes on. Can you see that it's all taught? What reconciled these two, then? That's a nail. Vav is a nail. In Hebrew, it's veh. It's the word and. If I'm John and Mary, what do I do to them? I nail them together. I bring them together and, and fix them together. The key word is fix. If you want to understand that symbol in its, full, in that symbol in its fullest context, read carefully section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Mm -hmm. You go into the school of the prophets. The guy meets you at the door who's going to be the instructor. You have to go through initiation. He stops you. What's he say? I salute you in token and remembrance of the everlasting covenant, into which covenant I receive you with a determination which is fixed, immovable, and unchangeable to be your friend and brother through the grace of God. It goes on and on, but you get the idea? A covenant is that which fixes and makes it fixed, immovable, and unchangeable. A law of God which comes out of his mouth. Though my, the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall what? Not pass away. Not pass away. His law is fixed, immovable, and unchangeable. It is nailed. Okay? So whenever you see the vav in the Hebrew, you insert the concepts that we've just discussed. Covenant, law, divine decree. See how that works? And so it is law, then, that binds what? Justice and mercy. Is there a depth to that word we've not appreciated before? So now watch what happens when we're talking in, in the section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. Hearken, O ye people of my church, saith the what? The voice of him who dwells on high. The voice of the Lord is unto all men, and there are, there is none to escape. Why cannot we escape the voice? No one can escape the law of justice and mercy. No one can get out of our judgment. We're all going to be brought before the great tribunal. We can't escape our voice, his voice. The voice of warning is unto all people by the mouths of my disciples whom I chose in the last days. What are we being warned about? The impending judgment. Coming before him, setting upon his throne. Okay, so watch this verse. And also the Lord shall have power over his saints and shall what? Reign in their midst and come down in judgment upon the world. But by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. So if I'm a good bishop and I've got the Holy Ghost, the power of discernment, and I know who to bless and who to what? Curse. Who to discipline and who to send to the temple. 
and I know how to do that, then can I be the voice of God upon the earth for my people? Because I know how to reconcile justice and mercy. mercy. Okay, now, you see how that word coal is important on all these different levels? Now let's use it a different way. Let's drop a degree or jump up a degree and look at it slightly differently. We're going to start now entering into the concepts of the alphabet and grammar. Let me diverge for just one second, leave this one idea with you. The word for scepter, these are scepters, right? The word for scepter in Hebrew is mem, okay? Uh, kof and lamad. Okay? Showing that who is mem? Who's this bird? Is he the anointed king? That's what Messiah means, right? So you have Christ holding. That's what the word for scepter is. It's also related to the word melech, which means king. Phonetically, melech. It's what in, we would call in English rod or staff. That's why there's two different words for it. So David comes and he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. They're crossed. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Why? Because I know I'm going to get a fair judgment. Yeah. The rod of my mouth? You're going to get whipped. See how that works? It's, it's just wordplay. Okay. Now we're going to start working with this in the alphabet and grammar. Uh, <coughs> let's go with a phrase from the alphabet and grammar. Ve cleflo isis. Isis. Ve cleflo isis. Joseph Smith says ve is five. If you want to see how it is five, simply draw a whole circle. You'll recognize the part that's blackened out is one-fifth of the whole. Okay? That's how he got that part. Ve, or five, the fifth fixed star. Cle, flow, light, okay? Isis meaning sit, you know, in Hebrew, I mean, in Egyptian means to, to sit. Okay, so you've got ve, cle, flow, Isis. This is what I want to concentrate on now, is what's a cle? We've talked about these symbols up here, and we've talked about the phonetics of those sounds. What does Joseph Smith say it does to stars? It fixes stars. How does it fix them? They no longer wander where they're not supposed to go. So if we're going to take, we've talked about justice and mercy, now let's talk about physics and see if these same symbols don't apply in a different way. If I'm a god and I have this celestial shepherd's crook, and I want to bring a planet toward me, I reach out with it and I hook it with my shepherd's crook and I draw it toward me, we call that power gravity. If I want to take that planet and I want to send it away, I take my little godly flicker, whip flail, and I what? I use the, the opposite force, repulsions, repulsion, and I send it flying. If I do not want to do either one of those things, if I want to fix it so neither force moves that planet from where I have set it, if I want to nail it in position, what do I do? I clee it. I fix, I coal it. I balance the forces. The shepherd's crook and the flail are balanced, nailed, fixed together, and therefore the planet stays where I want it to be. Can you see that's in here? You see now, we can read it on these two different levels. Now let's talk about the word kolob then. That's a fun word from out of the doctrine, I mean, the Pearl of Great Price. What was Beth? The B sound again? Man's first residence. Does that relate to kolob? Okay. Is kolob a fixed star? So, 
could Kolob simply on if you read it on one degree be what? Man's first residence, which is fixed in its position. Okay. Okay. See how that could do it? Now we can read it another way. Could it be the home planet of him who would come to reconcile justice and mercy? Works, right? It could be the home planet of him who comes to reconcile justice and mercy who is double nailed at another degree. <coughs> yes. See how this works? So we have to learn now that we can be read. Joseph Smith starts to read it on one degree and then he just progresses. All right. Uh, we've been here for how long now? Let's take a break. Let's take a break and then we'll enter. <coughs> when we get back from the break, we'll discuss more about the alphabet and grammar and we'll start looking at how we can use these techniques that we've just discovered from the ancient rabbis to make sense of this confusing, confusing so-called gibberish of the anti-Mormons. Okay. Break time. You might find this interesting. As we look now to start to study language itself, and as we start to look at Hebrew, I wanted to show you how well organized the, the language is by way of structure too. Remember this word kol, justice and mercy? Watch for these same, I, what I did is I've given you some examples of other words that contain those symbols simple words, you know, threes and four letter words, in hopes that you could see the pattern of the structure of the language coming out of that and how these things would be used. Is mercy and justice opposite principles? So, if I put a B between them, okay, meaning first residence or beginning or womb or source, okay, in the beginning or source, justice and mercy were What's the definition? Opposite, in opposition to one another. That's how I write, that's how the word is defined in Hebrew. Showing you that the component part of the cartouche, if you will, as if the letters form a cartouche, tells you the definition of what it is. We move down, remember what the T was? Scales of balance, remember? Okay, if you put the scales of balance with mercy and justice, the definition of that word becomes to weigh. Because on the scales we are weighed against justice and mercy. What is suspended in a balance? To be suspended in the balance is, this is shin. I don't know if you've been introduced to that. This is a really interesting letter. <sighs> Took us a while to figure out what it was. This is the letter S. One of the two forms that you could say was S. Okay. The rabbi said it was feet, because it looks like feet. And I thought, what is it? Why would he? I don't know anybody has three legs, to, you know. And why would they be stuck in the air? I could not figure this one out. For the longest time, we had to work it, and then we saw how it was being used, and then it all became clear. Shin is a birth. This is the mother's legs, and here comes the child from the vortex. See how that works? And so the letter Shin is, the woman was driven into the wilderness and she brought forth a man-child, okay? But it's interesting what kind of birth is this? What kind of birth is it when the child comes feet first? Breach. A breach birth. So this is the second to the last letter in the alphabetical order. What's it telling us? We get all these prophecies about the world being taken as a woman in Travail of labor, okay? All a conference. Remember that little discourse at the beginning of conference? Look at this frequency of the 
earthquakes. What we're describing is a scale of frequency of the pangs of labor and birth. That's what we're witnessing. And so the second to the last letter in the alphabet, in which form in the timeline, is the children of men bring both, or the kingdom coming forth. Okay? All of those ideas tied up in that letter. But if it's the children of men, right, who is suspended in the balance then? The children of men are suspended in the balance against mercy and justice. Are you acquainted with uh, the term city of refuge under the Hebraic law? If I had accidentally killed someone and I didn't want the avenger of blood to get me, where could I go? City of refuge. What, is the, what are the letters which make up that word? You've got the M. This is the M, which is who? Christ. Its original form was the bird, right? It was later, the rabbi said, changed to a combination of the letter kolf and vav. I don't think they recognize the significance of that. They recognize that kolf is the palm and vav is the nail. And so you, the letter M is a nailed palm. And that stands for who? Christ. Messiah. Can you see how that works? Okay, so on this side of the city of refuge, you, you have the Messiah, and what's he got? Symbol of mercy, right? He's got the shepherd, I'm the good shepherd, right? Divide the word in half. On the opposite of that is the justice. So what's this tet? If I drew the tet like this, could you see what originally was? Doc, throw something at him. So, what you have is the word has to be counterbalanced. Since the city of refuge was neutral ground, and you could not be called to judgment there, where are you? You have the Messiah. Counter juxtaposition is opposite of Messiah, Satan, right? Mercy is opposite of justice. What does Satan cry for? He is called the accuser of the brethren. Give me justice. You kick me out for disobeying. You've got to kick all the rest of those kids out too, or you're not just, Father. What's Christ then do? He pleads for mercy, and therefore he is called the advocate. So what is the city of refuge? Neutral ground. Neutral ground. Yeah. Exactly what it is. That's what it is. So now we get to see that the Hebrew words, once you understand these 22 symbols and how they work, that the Hebrew words form formulas, like H2O. If you know what H is and you know what O is, it equals water. If you know M, Kof, Lama, Tet, it is what it is. It is neutral ground. But it has to be opposites. They have to be positioned opposite. You can't have things out of balance or principles out of balance within the words themselves. For example, look at all these words in which you have two justices, two L's, double L's in them. You've got two doses of justice. What happens to the word? Look at the definitions that fall out. You've got justice. You've got to be light. Light in what sense? That light, in the, you were weighed light in the scales of balance. Therefore, you, it is synonymous with being despised or condemned. You can be cast down or destroyed. What? It is that which is vile or worthless. It is subject to a double dose of justice, and there's no mercy to counterbalance it. If I put two mercies in a word, what kind of word comes out? Messiah, mercy, mercy, it is pity. He gives us pity. Marvelous the way the structure of this language works. But unless you have the keys, you could say that was all, what? Just coincidence? Or is that evidence to the grand order of the whole thing? Okay. All right, let's see. 
I'm going to enter now Joseph Smith's Egyptian alphabet and grammar. The copy I'm using, for those of you who haven't been acquainted with it yet, is a computerized copy prepared by a friend of mine by the name of